Hello everyone, welcome to our last panel. Uh, this panel will discuss ways in which architects approach and negotiate urban development, accessibility, not only with regards to housing, but to public and social spaces. The importance of research, context, location, and social behavior, as well as the multiple layers uh, of which enter the urban space. With us today, we have Munal Musfi, who is a practicing architect and founded Space Continuum, a research-based architecture studio in 2014. Her practice centers on creating new spatial possibilities across scales for shared socializing and everyday life. Muna has worked with Sharjah Art Foundation on various projects since 2005, and our collaborations have played a crucial part in the development of SAF, not just architecturally, but with regards to its values and missions. Uh, so Muna will start first with a presentation, and then we'll move to Yoshihara Tsukamoto, who's the co-founder uh, co of Atelier Bawao, a Tokyo-based architecture firm founded in 1992 with Momoyo Kaijima. Uh, the, firm, the firm is well known for its domestic and uh, cultural architecture and research exploring urban conditions of micro and, and ad hoc architecture. Uh, Yoshiharu is a professor at Columbia and a graduate of Tokyo Institute of Technology where he later taught in the architecture department. Um, there are certain uh, theories as well coined by Atelier Bawa that I think we could also reference a little bit here, uh, looking at uh, pet architecture in terms of uses for buildings that have been squeezed into leftover urban spaces, behaviorology, which is the study of the building's articulation, inherent properties of elements such as heat, wind, light, water, and the understanding of the individual and common human behavior leads to a stronger localized architecture micro-public spaces, and dame architecture, which is no good architecture. And um, so anyway, we can go into details with that. And then uh, last, but by no means least, we have uh, Manuel de Rivero, co-founder, architect and urbanist, co-founder of 511 Architects, uh, an architecture studio based in Lima, Peru, and uh, also part of uh, Super Sudaka, which is an international collective for urban research. He's currently the Dean of the Architecture School of Universi Universidad, uh, I can't pronounce this, UCAL in Lima. And also um, with uh, thinking, in terms of thinking with Super Sudaka, which is a Latin American, uh, young Latin American architects who met in Rotterdam and realized that the education within a European context had left them with inadequate knowledge of their own context. So it's really interesting to hear a little bit of how Super Sudaka also uh, think in relation to that. So uh, without further ado, I'll invite Mona to give a short presentation. Thanks. Hello. Uh, so in this presentation, I will be looking at the creation, construction, and reappropriation of space in response to ch changing needs and constructed identity and views of its users. I will start discussing artists and creators' spatial negotiation with an interior exhibition setup, and then move to the historic city of Sharjah and the politics of reappropriation of urban spaces by its various stakeholders. Sharjah Biennial 8 2007 was created by Mohamed Kazem, Eva Scherer, Jonathan Watkins around the theme Art Ecology and the Politics of Change. Artists with different philosophies and ideologies were to raise questions about an extended theme of ecology. The exhibition design at the Expo Center site for this biennial edition referenced the city as a spatial social construct applied to a created interior exhibition. Within that scenario, curator and designer became like facilitator, mediating between artists as they participate in drawing their own territories and their relationship with neighboring installation. These negotiations, supported by a fluid morphology of the exhibition that was materialized by a series of nine meter wide, four meter feet high freestanding element that could be stackered in a flexible order along five wide megastrips of the same width. 
frontally perceived, they define as needed, spaces of different scale, lighting, and intensity. So this exhibition was exploring the idea of for artists to self-organize. The community was connected through art and through the biennial team and curators, but despite this communality, negotiation were not always smooth. In support of the team and linking to the location, and this to show you the different adaptation of that structure. So in support of the theme, the linking to the location and its surrounding urban context, we used a rented or recuperated construction scaffolding system as the skeletal structure of the exhibition, which also supported the flexibility needed for negotiated space. It was to be a small contribution towards sustainable awareness and a symbolic gesture evoking that artist the artist of SP8 could possibly think of a different construction site. In, now I'm moving to the same negotiation, but on a much more complex, uh, in a more complex uh, site, on a more complex site, because in 2009, actually, Sharjah Biennial moved fully from the Expo Center to the historic city of Sharjah. The expo venue was the largest site for Sharjah Biennial 6, 7, and 8, in addition to the Sharjah uh, um, Art Museum venue. It was relatively easy for Sharjah Biennial. This is actually it's, uh, a map of Sharjah that shows you in red, Sharjah in 1822, in black in 1963, and the, and the sort of like the, the map the map that, there is, that these two layers are superposed on is a more like a recent map, 2010. To, sh to just have an idea of the growth of the city and, and to situate the historical area within the larger uh, sort of development as, of the city. So, in, so the, the, the biennial moved from the Expo Center to the Historic City Center, and this was relatively easy for Sharjah Biennial to reclaim historic links to this part of the city, uh, the Art Square, or Shuahin neighborhood. It's the area where members of the first Emirate Fine Art Society uh, that was founded in 1984 were used to meet. They had their, their building to this, the building to this date is located there. And also subsequently in 1997, there was Sharjah Art Museum uh, that was built facing the Serkal House, which is the old residency of the British native agent up to 1951. It was used as an art institute, exhibition space prior to the museum opening. In Sharjah Banyan Nile, the arts area became the site of many artistic intervention that address issues of site specificity social fabric, and identity through memory. To be further grounded in this area, the Biennial Nine followed a strategy of densification, concentration. To remedy the lack of spaces, artists were encouraged to occupy non-museum spaces, such as parking lots, storage facilities, and of the Sharjah Museum, as well as urban pockets. At that time, there were two main initiatives involved in the transformation of Sharjah material culture and social realm and shaping or reshaping its cultural identity, Sharjah Biennial and the Directorate of Heritage. The Directorate of Heritage viewed the partially reconstructed historical area as personifying an almost idealized version of Sharjah's material culture, acting like a shrine of Sharjah's past. In reality, the historical Sharjah is built of composite and many different construction periods within Sharjah's history. So while the Sharjah heritage has operated within a framework of tradition, the biennial operated within a framework of more international, regional, contemporary thought, offering this unique context for artist contribution. So Meder Lopez and Chelaguda site-specific installation revealed the sometimes masked social and intangible culture in this, in this area. In this sense, the process of layering and layering material culture become tactics used to define Sharjah's cultural identity. They helped us, me, very much to perceive the historical city as no longer a fixed, idealized shrine-like space, but rather fluid, flexible size, hence changing temporarily the area from a static museum to a sort of a more active space. Major Lopez foot, football field illustrate this power of construct to produce a fluid, constantly 
layer feeding into the space. Actually, it was done for a uh, residency, and, and to, in 2009, there was a secondary, uh, second work added to it, the fountain. Uh, and and Shelaguda's drip field also transformed an alley between the two buildings that house the Sharjah Art Museum into a peaceful environment. And this, she like redefined this overlooked space and, and re-evaluated the sites and it became a peaceful retreat for, from everyday hustle of life. In 2010, in preparation for Sharjah Biennial, uh, the, the biennial team met the Boreja area and documented many abandoned old enclosures to get the permission to use them for Sharjah Biennial 10 in the following year. It was then noted that the enclosure were all used as like, um, let's say storage uh, spaces uh, with ACs, old wooden beams, stones, wooden furniture. This documentation showed the need to activate the historical enclosure and had the unintended result of sort of empowering the Sharjah Art Foundation to be more actively engaged in Al-Bureja area. This was a moment of some tension between stakeholders inhabiting the area. This, this was year also, I think, of the formation of the Sharjah Art Foundation and its broader range of cultural programming. Um, hence the necessity to envision new fluid exhibition spaces anchored in Sharjah historical area. And uh, so this, uh, so the Sharjah Art Foundation possibly was occupying other territories because they were largely inactivated. And this, and they were following previous, and they were not necessarily following previously adopted renovation or reconstruction rules yet use some of the morphological and typological rules and element that already existed in the urban flag fragment and we were very strongly influenced by them. These rules corresponded to different use and different epoch. So the idea is this fragment to be a good host, opening to its surrounding, sensitive to its content. Yes, in a different way that was thought, uh, previously thought for the area. But what is important is that the project adaptive as an adapt, new, new adaptive urban reuse took the party of uh, integration of typo typological integration and it only occupied 60% of the allocated site for SAF in order to preserve existing coral houses, courtyard houses and, and coral enclosure. So the, only 60% was used for the new galleries and and, and, but the whole site was conceived by Sharjah Art Foundation as one space for contemporary art with integrated historical and contemporary layer that celebrated the whole fragment. Another area of urban contestation in the historical area of Sharjah is the Bank Street a thoroughfare dating from the late 1970s. You could see this bank street from the Sharjah Art Foundation new galleries. And it was a mid-rise, it's formed of the mid-rise building aligned e on, a seven, on either side of a 70 meter wide thoroughfare. And they reconstructed al Hassan Fort located at its center. It is the encapsulation of a specific wave of urban and architecture modernity in Sharjah and an era where there was a real uh, impetus toward economic development resulting from these drastic changes in the physical form and social dream of the city. This fragment physically divided the continuity between two neighborhoods and ruptured the vital continuity of the souk. Uh, a stakeholder, uh, Shuruk, uh, was formed in 2009 and was, has commissioned Dar al Amran to present a vision for the historical center of Sharjah. Dar al Amran proposed a historicist project that had a vision to remove in phases the whole Bank Street urban fragment and all modern building of the 70s and 80s along the Corniche. The new plan is to attract more people into the area and, not, and people that don't live in the area also. But in this scenario, the current population could have been displaced. But failed architecture 
a research platform that aimed to open up new perspective on urban failure, was invited by Mariah, actually in our space under Shuruk, to study the fragment. In fact, rather than going along with Shuruk vision, they helped gather many voices that were concerned by the projected removal of the Bank Street. And Sharjah Biennial 11 also had a different temporary idea for transforming a building and a space in the area. It occupied the Islamic Bank building, which was scheduled for demolition, but also for that same biennial that was, a, to me, a great biennial, <laughs> curated by Yoko Hasegawa, Superflex, a Danish artist collective, um, reclaimed, envisioned a site-specific urban installation that occupies a temporary reclaimed urban island. The collective imagined a new non-monetary banking model that converted memory into physical urban objects that inhabitants from the area were asked to nominate from their country of origin. So the bank project mended physically and socially this extended urban space and demonstrated social activation throughout, throughout, through the turnout of hundreds of people that were inhabiting the park. So the park was very successful, yet the problem, and I can see how it could be a problem, it only attracted people from the area. So another point of contention between institution uh, operating in the area is the intended branding of this historical fragment presently referred to as heart of Sharjah, because branding by its very nature simplifies the complexity of an experience, eliminate the so site social richness and potential for transformation, adaptation, and change. Today, there is a step back from the grand vision, two towers that were demolished on Bank Street, but overall the fragment will survive and possibly the full-on branding will not take place. So the historical urban fragment is constantly adapting to new shifting, urban and social condition. So Sharjah Historic Center expresses a cultural fluidity of a historically multi-ethnic city, the survival of which was principally based on physical and cultural exchange. The vitality of the city center is contingent on, to the preservation of its receptive and adaptive characteristics. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, good, good afternoon. Yeah. I'm very happy to be here uh, to give a talk. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. The beautiful city, Shaoja. Yeah. <coughs> beautiful Emirates, Shaoja. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, today the, the topic is about uh, yes accessibility to the housing, etc. But uh, yeah, but accessibility is one of the very important issue today how to think about, how to reframe the word accessibility. For example, in architectural design, in the school of architecture, accessibility is mainly discussed about making ramp elevators to bridge the two different levels in order to make uh, handicapped people to, uh, to reach every place in, in, the, in the building. But, uh, and then this is called barrier-free design or universal design. But actually, in the society, there are so many different types of barrier which blocks between uh, peoples to access to certain re local, local resources or certain rights. So <clears throat> I, I think now architectural design is, not, is finding those type of uh, barrier in the society after the 20th century, and then challenge tackling those barriers to resolve it, uh, or punch out, or uh, destroy it, to create better accessibility uh, to the local resources. And um, so, <coughs> uh, okay. But uh, today, I, I, at first, I, I like to talk about housing, and um, <coughs> especially two different type of uh, house project in very, very uh, 
larger sense, not only one project, but the kind of uh, social project of making house in different period. Uh, the first one is a, a single family that touched the house, occupying the surface, most of the surface of Tokyo. And, uh, it, and then the second one is today's reconstruction after a big earthquake, tsunami, and explosion of a nuclear power plant in 2011. And, and, then, and comparing those two different types of uh, uh, houses, housing projects, uh, or uh, both are also recovery projects, uh, because Tokyo is, uh, uh, Tokyo, Tokyo's uh, urban fabric is produced by, during the, uh, through the recovery process of, uh, 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 from the uh, destruction by the war. So uh, comparing two, two different uh, house, house projects, we, I like to discuss uh, about uh, uh, the accessibility to the house, housing. So this is a, a view from uh, observatory of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government um, designed by Kenzo Tange. And uh, on the uh, northwest direction, and you see infinity uh, con repetition of uh, tiny small grains until the foot of the mountain. And this is the uh, actual uh, urban fabric of Tokyo. Tokyo is not the city made of uh, skyscrapers. It is uh, most of the surface is occupied by those small grains. Most of them are single family house and small apartment and owned by individual, not public owned, publicly owned. And, um, uh, and then most of people are living in this type of uh, urban fabric. And behind this uh, type nature of the city, there is uh, in, uh, this uh, a very interesting statistics. Uh, yeah. The lifespan of the house is extremely short in Japan. It's only 30 years. In compared to England, it's 141. So big difference. It, if 141, it's almost infrastructure of the city. But this is a, a kind of, a, uh, how do you say, commodity. Huh? And uh, it's because of uh, we experienced the uh, uh, big destruction of the city twice. And then every time reconstruction was happened, happened very quickly. So uh, people didn't spend so much time, uh, time and money for the f reconstruction. So it didn't uh, last so long time. But at the same time, there is an uh, economical or tax system which in, uh, accelerated this uh, short lifespan. And uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, this type of uh, um, yeah urban fabric s have started uh, for the re reconstruction of the city uh, in the post-war era. M war means uh, World War Second in this case, and uh, most of the surface of Tokyo has been burnt out. And then at that time, the government didn't have money, of course. Uh, government spent most of the money for war. And then secondly, uh, Japanese, uh, Japan was not in fully independent at that moment. We were under the control of GHQ. So big planification of uh, new city urban planning uh, and uh, spending a lot of budget for making uh, uh, social housing, uh, both are rejected by GHQ. And so government could only uh, <coughs> ask people, uh, yeah, only, only policy uh, which government could do, could launch, was ask people to, to make their own houses from whom, who can build, yeah. And um, so this is a very strong incentive uh, for our city to become uh, a city of single family detached house. And the uh, government established a, a very low rate uh, house mortgage and uh, also established uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, 
registered architect uh, regulation. So if you want to utilize this low rent uh, house mortgage, you have to work together with architects. So this is why Japanese architects have been uh, involved in the uh, single family house design a lot. And then <coughs> within this kind of uh, um, uh, texture, um, yeah, in, but in 1960s, several architects like uh, uh, Maki, Kikutake, and um, Kurokawa, and uh, critic Kawazoe, and Otaka, uh, architect, uh, they made a, a, a manifest metabolism for design uh, <coughs> uh, meeting uh, in nine, world design meeting in 1960s. 60 in Tokyo, and uh, they made the, the um, uh, manifesto called Metabolism, a very famous Japanese movement in the 60s. And um, this is uh, one of the most uh, famous buildings from that period, uh, designed by Kisho Kurokawa. It's called Nakagin Capsule Tower. Uh, it clearly represents the idea of metabolism, that urban uh, creation and uh, is happening by the concentration of power and capital. So the, uh, the central core contains uh, our lifelines and uh, all the circulation, and these capsules represent individuals are considered to be replaced in every two year, 20 years, for example. But actually what, what actually happened in Tokyo is in this type of metabolism, yeah, yeah, still city metabolize, uh, grain by grain, but uh, without this kind of concentration, uh, it uh, all spreads out and it's scattered on this very uh, thin surface of the ground, and uh, and then most of them are owned by different families. So there are one million, 1.8 million landowner in Tokyo. So it's uh, very difficult to to launch the big uh, intervention of changing the city, city structure. So, <clears throat> and then, but the, these, these grains are theoretically replaced regionally into new one every, in every 30 years. So, but, uh, on keeping the gap of void between buildings, because though all buildings are detached, so, every construction produces gap space between buildings. So while keeping this gap or void, the, all the grains constantly replacing into, uh, are replaced into new one. So we call this uh, void metabolism, um, making a contrast with this uh, 60s metabolism, metabolism uh, 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 symbolized by core. So I call this core metabolism. And within this uh, uh, type of urban fabric, there is an interesting phenomena uh, through the behavior of this regeneration of houses. For example, this is uh, uh, Okusawa area. Uh, actually, it's uh, 94 years old. It's the, the development started from 1923. And uh, this phenomena I call subdivision. It's a subdivided suburban. So the, it, it is actually fast suburban development, but now it's totally swallowed in the urban, uh, uh, urban fabric. So people living here don't think that they are living in the suburban area. They, are, they believe that they are living cro very close to the city center. So <coughs> what is happening? Yeah, this is a very general view of the area. It's a very London. So many different type of houses, different colors, shape. <laughs> age, huh? height, yeah? shape, yeah, yeah. Uh, style. So there's no certain, no canons uh, in this kind of landscape. And, but if you really uh, watch carefully, there is a, a kind of hidden order behind this kind of phenomena. So it's simply, it, it's explained, this phenomena can be explained by the subdivision of the property from, uh, this is the initial uh, plan of the, this area. The, each property has uh, had uh, 250 square meter, two, or almost 2,500 
square feet, something like that. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it's small, huh? In com yeah. Yeah, it's, al it's already small if you compare to the, maybe, um, the property in the Middle East. But, uh, and then, but it's uh, already experienced the subdivision in, in uh, already in 1970s, it's already subdivided into small pieces. Why this kind of uh, subdivision happens? It's because of uh, the uh, uh, rise of uh, um, uh, a property, rise of the, uh, the price of the property, and um, and we had uh, we have a very high inheritance tax to to in order to distribute the fortune from one limited population into a much larger population. So uh, the house and property is also uh, the is important target to apply this uh, policy. And uh, <clears throat> for example, in, but in 1980s, we experienced a bubble economy and uh, this 200, 500, 250 square meter uh, property uh, was uh, around uh, three million dara, and uh, and then if you are a single child, uh, you you have to pay half of it when you inherit from your parent. So, but normal employee can't afford to pay for that. So they start divide the property into two pieces and create this kind of square for themselves, and then this is this flagpole shape for. Uh, for saving, for sale, for sale. And uh, so this process uh, make uh, um, the uh, residential area very um, random, random and uh, um, um, yeah, yeah. And this, but we still see the, uh, the first generation because this regeneration is totally up to the uh, family's condition. Some family, keeps all the house, and, um, <clears throat> and the second generation, around 1950s, 30s, I don't know, 50s, 60s, and then around 1980s, uh, 90s. So the, this case, the developer buys this uh, uh, original initial uh, 250 property and subdivides them into three or four pieces and uh, build those houses and sell to the middle class people. So the, this is a kind of a transformation of a single family detached house in residential area in Tokyo. And it's, we can say that the history of uh, uh, single family house in 20th century is a history of uh, losing the generosity. It became more and more intolerant. So this is a, this is a uh, uh, then what should we do? Because after 2010, most of the house, all the house we, uh, which is going to be built are uh, considered fourth generation house. So what, what is the premise of a fourth generation house? So we uh, summarize the uh, characteristic of uh, uh, the 20th century uh, uh, house, too pure for nuclear family, too much interiorized by production of gap space. And then I tried to uh, make, make uh, to, I tried to do something opposite. So the premise for, of a fourth generation house should be the space with non-family members, more opportunity to stay outside of the house, redefine the gap space. And then one of the example is um, a house in Atri Bawao, where uh, I and Momoyo is working and uh, living. It's this red house. Oh, yeah. oh it's not uh, clear. So <clears throat> the space is uh, vertically connected and laterally connected. And then on the bottom part are office and upper part is house. So this is a living room where both uh, office and house can be utilized, can use. And uh, it's a kind of mixing chamber between house and office. M and many s things can happen. So the house is hidden from the public, st from the street because it's built on the flagpole site, 
which is produced by the subdiv subdivision of the property. And then this is interior space. So it's, you see the, this is the entrance, and then yeah, you go up and then see the living room and dining space, it's, but it's all connected. So in, in our house, there are always non-family members. Of course, we know them. But uh, this, is, uh, this is very important to, to design the house for semi-open or semi-closed membership. Because during the 20th century, house became more and more uh, specifically designed for very closed membership. And um, it's, people appreciate privacy, but uh, at the same time, it's lost uh, kind of generosity. And then I, I, but I think now it's a really critical for, in order to think about the, our livelihood, because uh, uh, which in, if you think about the condition of livelihood, we can't establish our livelihood without others, without our environment. So it's better to have a better, how to say, connectivity and uh, uh, how to say, open gesture towards outside. So this is uh, one of the uh, yeah, solution. So this uh, living room is very open and uh, try to utilize uh, neighbor's wall as our wallpaper. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite nice because uh, it's, uh, the texture uh, is constantly changed by the light, lighting condition. And then the land, landing is occupied by models, this case. So the staircase is relatively big uh, in compared to other houses, normal houses. Uh, we have this balcony in the, in the northern side to try to gain the gap space as much, as, much as possible to our uh, territory. Okay, so this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, context, uh, Japanese architects worked a lot on single family house. So last year, uh, I was involved in the uh, uh, exhibition titled Japanese House. Uh, this is a catalog for Italian and English, and this is uh, another version, Japanese version, but with English. And then this is more, how to say, let's say it's it's better one. <laughs> and then it's uh, this exhibition uh, was held in Rome, Maxi, and Burbican, and then this was held in uh, Modern Art Museum in Tokyo. And I worked as the chief advisor and uh, almost like curator and uh, exhibition designer. So, and then I wrote a lot in um, about the critical space, how architecture, how Japanese contemporary architecture have been. Uh, have, have been developed uh, through this um, practice of designing a uh, single family detached house. Okay, and then another uh, type of house, oh, yeah, today. So this is uh, uh, the area where the 2011 Tohoku big earthquake attacked. So it's, it's 150 kilometers long coastline which were damaged. And uh, I, we were, we formed, we, I'm a fun, I, I, I was a founder of uh, uh, Pro Bono uh, Architect uh, uh, Network called ArchiAid to help the recovery of, uh, of Tohoku. And um, we focused on this small peninsula, which was, which is here. It's just in front, in front of the epicenter. So um, there are 28 beaches and small villages in each beaches, a small bay. Uh, they are all, most of them are totally destroyed. So especially this side, 100% houses were swallowed by tsunami. And this side, 70% uh, of houses were swallowed. And uh, so, so this is uh, uh, the scene, the, the view of a fisherman's village in 1960s, the one called the Samurai Hama, uh, on the on 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 the southern side. So it's uh, the houses are built with uh, local timbers and uh, from the forest, and with uh, local carpenters, and the life is totally uh, connected to the sea. So people live actually live 
between uh, sea and forest. They also do some farming. And uh, so actually, a fisherman is not uh, a purely fisherman. They are also farmers, they are also carpenters, they are also forest managers. And so they do a lot of things. And uh, they are so much, they are very talented people. They, but this is uh, uh, the, uh, the view of the samurai hammer just after the tsunami. So most of the house on the, on the lower level are destroyed by tsunami. So, and then government established this, new, this scheme this time. So in 1945, after the uh, World War II, government couldn't do anything. So they let people to make their own houses. But this time, government tried to take all the responsibility. So saying that, okay, you shouldn't live on the lower level where you, where you used to be occupied by houses. And then, of course, yes, and then uh, the uh, government promised to the villagers that they will build a new residential area on top of the hill and then create a sea dike to protect the village from the another uh, big tsunami in many, in probably in next 80 years. And then uh, ask, uh, and then designate this raw, raw area for the production or the works and etc. But since uh, the, um, the, this area, very, very remote area from, from the city, have confronted uh, the depopulation for a long time. And uh, they are almost uh, uh, disappearing. And then this tsunami attacked this area. So basically, it's, the population are very much aged. And uh, many people spend a f few years in the refugee camp or refugee uh, temporary apartment, temporary housing. But they, uh, they were totally discouraged to go back to the, their hometown because they feel like, oh, they, we, we are going to die. And then we have to make an, a new house in different city. And then they have already, and then also young generation have also started uh, <coughs> their own life and their kids go to the public schools and they have another job. So it's very difficult to go back to the, the, the city. So the, this, this scheme is now facing big problem, yeah. But the, uh, in order, but the, it was, uh, we didn't know, yeah, we, I, I knew this kind of a problem might happen, but the, anyway, we have to find a place to make a new residential area on top of the hill. So uh, it's, uh, we went to the uh, villages and then start asking people uh, where you want to s build new, re new, new houses and uh, on watching the map and, uh, and also walking together. But uh, uh, most of the houses were gone, so we have to understand their lifestyles. So we start asking many questions. Uh, where, uh, how, uh, what time you wake up, when, and which type of uh, uh, fish do you fish, or uh, where, where do you drink together, and which kind of a festival do you, do you have and so all, many questions. So, and then we realize that we are, we are not like architect. We are almost like a ethnographer. So, and then based on the ah yeah, we visit this uh, the the old destroyed village and also on in in the mountain, there are a lot. There are planted cedar trees. It's a artificially planted uh, forest from 1950 uh, and uh, now, uh, and 60s. And so now it, they are 50, 60 years old, but the, since after 1980s, the, the price of uh, Japanese timber couldn't com became uncompetable against the imported timber from uh, North America after Plaza Agreement. And then, then uh, from 19, 19, 1980s, the, these type of forests are, are unmanaged. 
So it's a very dark, it's very inaccessible. So actually, they have a forest, they have a timber here, but uh, if we don't do anything, the new house, which is going to be built on the new residential area, will be built by the timbers from North America or something like that. So we are very uh, wor we worried about this because these type of beautiful villages could be only built by local network, uh, using local timbers and uh, uh, local carpenters taking time and it's and then uh, reading the topography very carefully, then they can make uh, their villages totally fit to the nature. But the new development might really destroy this. Uh, network and then okay. The after the the hearing was uh, 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 noted in this kind of a map, hand drawing map because we couldn't use electricity in the in in the camp which is we we found in uh, we we had in the abandoned uh, uh, elementary school. So <coughs> so this is a potential area for new housing on top of the hill, and then. Already, we started to to draw the future wish of uh, of the village of the of the beach. Uh, for example, having the yacht club, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we realize that the people, the the number of people who wants to come back, uh, the hometown, uh, decreasing and decreasing, time after time. So we try to uh, encourage people to think about new house by proposing a tiny little house, uh, affordable tiny little house. And, uh, but at the same time, we try to utilize the local timber as much as possible. So we took, we, we applied a, a very traditional construction technique, Itakura, uh, and um, uh, proposed this. Yeah, and then the, this, uh, co it's called the core house. We just uh, built the core of the house, the heart of the house, uh, kitchen and the, da uh, the, the room with tatami and the bathroom with loft, but uh, this house can be extended um, <coughs> if the business, the fishing uh, business uh, start. It, they can easily earn money, so they can build more. And this is a construction method, uh, the itakura. Ita means board. So in this case, uh, the balls are already pre-connected um, in the factory by very thin uh, metal seats on both sides. And then it sli slides down into the, in between the columns. And then it works as an anti-seismic wall, but same time interior wall. So this is a construction. It's a very small house, but it takes uh, just uh, two days to finish. <laughs> okay, so the interior is like this, full of uh, um, the good smells of uh, uh, cedar tree. They are all cedar trees, yeah. Actually, those trees are not from this mountain because uh, this area is uh, quite, uh, it's, it's quite difficult for this area to provide those uh, uh, good timber in this uh, uh, disaster moment. So we asked the southern part of Japan, uh, and we found a very good uh, uh, wood mill factory in southern part of Japan and then uh, worked together to make this house. Yeah. <coughs> And then, yeah, yeah this is uh, the, uh, the typical uh, farming, I don't know, fishing village. It's a, uh, another village, but uh, it started from the port, and then the houses are built along the uh, street, and then the street uh, has also small creek, and then the houses are aligned like this, uh, fitting to the topography. So it's a very naturally fits to the landscape. But, uh, ah, and then this area have experienced many tsunami in the past. So the, the last one was uh, 1960s from Chile. 
and then this chilly tsunami uh, hit Japan. And then also 1933, uh, there was big uh, tsunami. And, and then this is a street, uh, the area which is uh, reconstructed after uh, tsunami 1933, but uh, it's still very natural. And then you see, we can still see this type of house, which is built at that time by the local carpenters and uh, with very good details, and etc. But what is actually happening now, if you go there, you discover this re new residential area like this. So they cut uh, the, the mountain and then make flat land and then divide the property uh, 300 square meter each. And then the people build house uh, provided from the house maker. So this is uh, the zoom in, zoom in. So it's uh, totally different from uh, this type of uh, um, yeah, this type of uh, uh, fisherman's village. So it's already, it's almost the uh, same as Tokyo Suburbia. This is a uh, housing, <coughs> suburban housing in Tokyo. And uh, these series uh, photos are taken by Takashi Homa. And uh, the book was published in 1998. So this is a kind of a, uh, living condition, living environment, uh, livelihood, totally produced by the uh, industrial society network and uh, this local uh, local network was replaced by social uh, industrial society network this time so government says oh we are doing well because uh, for them the recovery is about is is about the number of houses not about the network but I think it, it's really, um, it's, uh, I think no one feel, uh, how to say, uh, affection on this type of uh, house. And then I think they will lose uh, population much sooner. And then, <clears throat> so in, in, a, in one of the a village, uh, my partner, Momoyo, uh, it became very, very close to the uh, villagers, especially the chief of the villager, and who has a very open mind and very wide, uh, wide perspective. And uh, the, they agreed that uh, the main problem of this region is uh, depopulation. And they don't have uh, successors of uh, fishing. So the chief of the town village want, wanted to start a fisherman's village, which is totally unexisted in Japan, because teaching fishing is from father to son. It's, it's like that. There's no school about fishing. So, but uh, this time, it's a fast challenge for our society to open fisherman's school. Of course, it's called a school, but there is no building. We, the, it's a boat and the sea and the temples and the, so, and then there is no teacher. So it's a fisherman who is the teacher. And then, but I think it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a kind of a day schooling, day school of uh, fishing. And um, so the school started from the temporary uh, temple. <laughs> it's really, it, it's a temporary, uh, prefabricated unit for construction site. And then the, the uh, monk uh, transformed it into temple because they are very uh, demanded. So many people died. So it's extremely important to start temple soon, although it is temporary uh, space. And then they do, uh, they are doing uh, uh, this uh, Momonora village. Uh, uh, doing many different type of fishing, but the main one is uh, uh, oyster farming. So they learn how to uh, make uh, uh, the, the shelf of uh, uh, catching the, uh, the baby of uh, uh, oyster from the sea, and then they go to sea to fish with a net, 
and they also learn how to cook fish. And, uh, and then, so it's every time they have uh, five to 15 students from many different places in Japan. And uh, the eighth version, a uh, volume, was about mountain. So gradually they realized that, uh, uh, the school realized that uh, the activity of the fishermen is not only in the sea, it's also uh, ex go into the mountain. So this interrelationship between mountain and sea is extremely fundamental for the life of the fishermen. So they start, this is a, a, a mountain vo volume of a fisherman's school. And then through this, uh, as they cut trees and uh, uh, make fire logs and etc. And then finally, they, at the end of the school, they, they made this plan to make a new uh, kind of camping site, but at the same time, it's a kind of uh, uh, tiny houses. Uh, to invite people to stay because uh, the, this uh, new residential area uh, up on the hill uh, initiated by government, they only allow to make a new property for the number of the inhabitants who wants to come back. So then the, the only eight family came back and build houses before they had 50 families. And then but there is no place for newcomers who became fish, who wants to become fishermen in this village. So they decided to open this uh, uh, wood and create a kind of uh, uh, space for living. But uh, at first, it is a kind of a school to learn the uh, knowledge and skills to live in this kind of a, a natural environment. So Momonora Village is a place to learn and teach, a uh, mutual uh, education uh, place uh, to learn how to deal with wood, how to deal with fish, how to deal with river, uh, etc. And so, yeah, they also cook. And so they, yeah, this is a property newly pr produced. Uh, this is a rebuilt uh, stone wall. Which, used, which was deteriorated, but then originally this, uh, this kind of stone wall was also built by fishermen. And last summer, we had a summer school asking people to come to construct together the small house. And then young architects designed small houses, tiny houses, and then uh, it's built by the students uh, of this summer school. And uh, this is uh, in today's condition. This is the main building designed by Bauer, Atri Bauer, built by a carpenter because uh, it's, a bit too, it's a bit too big by, by students. And then those are built by students. And uh, yeah, this, it's a very simple, cheap building, but uh, uh, the nature is really uh, luxury. So <clears throat> you can really learn many, diff many things. And uh, <clears throat> so to, to summarize my 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 uh, presentation. I like to show this this diagram, which is very too too much simplified. But uh, actually, the uh, I learned from this uh, recovery process uh, how much industrial society network is. Uh, I'd say controlling our livelihood. And it's very difficult to go out from this network because people living in the city uh, believe that we are totally sit dependent on industry. Or most of the things are, are provided by industry as services. It's uh, good, it's convenient, but you have to pay. And um, but we, re we experienced uh, this, but, to, but the explosion of uh, uh, nuclear power plant in Fukushima was, uh, uh, it waked, waked many people up. Uh, oh, oh, where we are living? What is our living condition? What is our livelihood? It's totally dependent on the electricity which is produced by 
no, uh, somewhere we don't know, but we suddenly realize that, okay, electricity of Tokyo was produced by nuclear power plant in Fukushima. And then many people start thinking about how to reframe or revise our livelihood today, which is too, too much dependent on industrial network society. And then I pro I'm proposing uh, this, okay, to be more hybrid. Actually, we are hybrid in between ethnographical network. So the fishermen are very interesting type of people who really live this area. They are really hybrid. They know fish, they know the bottom of the sea, they know climate, they know the rituals, they know how to do the local festivals, they, they know cooking, they know singing, they know how to, yeah, jo they know joking and, and they know, but they know also they use smartphone, they also use high speed boat, they also use uh, uh, fish crowds radar, and they choose also the market to bring their fishes in order to get more money. Uh, so they watch the uh, market uh, prices uh, through internet. So they are actually very hybrid people. But uh, we are, in compared to them, we are very, how to say, fragile. Uh, and so, and then I realized that okay, the 20th century was a kind of project to bring people from ethnographical network who confronted the nature and then with their own skills and uh, uh, knowledge to utilize that and then pe bring people into this direction. And then the beginning of the 20th century, there are so many interesting buildings built. Many architects made masterpieces I think it's because they felt, they, they really experienced the conflict between the body which is grown up, which grown, grown up in the ethnographical network and counter into industrial society network. And then they utilize this friction as an energy to make very interesting buildings. And so why not? Why should we produce this kind of friction again? And then now I think it's, it's, it's possible to make a, a friction to, to bring us back into this direction, but uh, it's almost impossible to go into it. So let's find the interesting place within this hybrid. But we don't have, we have very poor word to describe hybrid. We only have one word, hybrid. But what is hybrid? But there are so many different types of hybrid. And then each specific case tells us, teaches us, how can we become hybrid? And then I think architectural project is extremely relative, uh, relevant to think about this kind of, uh, um, how to say, uh, diverse uh, hybrid, diversity of hybrid. And then by doing that, uh, yeah, this is a kind of, a, uh, how to say, image of the barrier which is established by the industrial uh, during the 20th century by industry. So we, if you live here, you don't access to the natural resources directly. It's an yeah, indirect relationship. Yeah, it's, it's called a service. But um, it's, yeah, here we can, re we can tackle this barrier and then lower that and then make better accessibility to local resources. And then I think it's, it's both, uh, this can be applied, this idea can apply for housing, also for public space, or for designing the uh, fast, uh, urban facilities. I think it's many kind of project can, can, can work together with this idea. Uh, thank you for listening.